All right, welcome everyone. This is Megan Giesker from ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Empathizing with Teens in Trauma, an Exploration of the Terrazine Ghetto Camp. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Before we start, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is a presentation of ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund in cooperation with the American Association of School Librarians. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars like this one. Next slide, please. A couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only the presenter has microphone access. Live captions can be enabled by clicking on show captions. We will be disabling the chat during the presentation and reopening it during the Q&A discussion. Please save your questions and comments for the end. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A window to communicate with ALA staff. Now I'd like to turn things over to Blake Hopper to share some remarks. Next slide, please. Hey everyone and welcome. My name is Blake Hopper. I am the chair of the Sarah Jeffernan School Library Program Award. I am a proud to introduce today's webinar, Empathizing with Teens in Trauma and Exploration of the Terrazana Ghetto Camp. The program series that won the 2022 Sarah Jeffernan Award. The ward committee was immediately drawn to the examples of St. Mary's area middle school put on by creating a multi-dimensional learning experience that promotes empathy, creativity, and compassion amongst students, said Erica Brunson Rochette, Jafarian Award Committee member. By interacting by by intersecting Holocaust curriculum with trauma response, the program uniquely uniquely ties together history, art, and mental health education in a powerful and impactful way. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to introduce our speakers this afternoon. We have four great people lined up for you. Our first one is Ellen Stolarski. Ellen has been the librarian at St. Mary's Area Middle School since 2012. As a librarian, she works to promote collaboration, technology, a love of reading, and information literacy skills to her school. Our next one is Cassie Beeler. She is a sixth grade ELA teacher at St. Mary's Area Middle School. She is a passionate about middle school and is currently teaching in her 14th year. Our next one is Tracy Meeker. Tracy is also a sixth grade ELA teacher at St. Mary's and she just began her 24th year of teaching. And lastly, we have Desiree Cross. She is the school social worker at St. Mary's and works with all the students from grades kindergarten through 12th grade. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our presenters. Next slide, please. Hi, folks, and thanks for joining us for Empathizing with Teens in Trauma, an exploration of the Terrazine Ghetto and Camp. Um, so let's get started. Um, before we kind of get started into the fun stuff, let's talk about our school and where we are and what we look like because especially if you're looking to try and adapt this into your own program, it's always good to kind of understand what challenges schools have. So you can see on the map, we are a very rural school. Um, some parts of our district don't even have cell service. Uh, we service grades six through eight. Currently, we have about 425 students. Um, we're Title I. Uh, we are one-to-one -one Chromebook, and our school day is an eight-period day where we live on a 47-minute bell, or 47 minutes a period. Although English and reading, we get to uh, Tracy and Casey get to see the kiddos twice a day. So let's just kind of, we'll say hi to each other. So I'm Ellen. I'm Casey. I teach sixth grade reading English. Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm also a sixth grade reading and English teacher. I'm Desiree Grace, the district social worker. Awesome. So basically the goal of today is for you to understand our collaborative process and how we got something so fleshed out because as we know, collaboration takes work. Um, and then also some methods for teaching the uh, specific search strategies. And then Desiree has some mental health stuff at the end as well. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how we teach the Holocaust, because it is a subject that can be controversial. It is a subject that we do tread lightly because of the age of our students. Our students, for the majority, Tracy and I's kids are around 11 years old. So 
going into a project of this, it's just important to keep in mind that you're picking resources that are developmentally appropriate for these students and making sure that you're, the topics that you're discussing are also appropriate for their age. So we've done several novel studies. Since we do teach both reading and English, we have the fluidity in our schedules that we can be working on a novel and reading and also working on writing and other pieces of the Holocaust in English. So two of, one of the resources that we like one is the boy on the wooden box. The other one is the devil's arithmetic that depending on what we're looking for, one is a fiction book and one is a nonfiction. I think it's also important to note that when we use the devil's arithmetic, we pull in, that is the fiction piece. We pull in a lot of nonfiction, making sure the kids are aware of what the truth was and what the actual facts were. Um, when, when approaching a subject like this, it's really important for us also to make sure that we're very open with our students and with the families that we are dealing with. We teach this in May. So at this point, we know our students very well. We know their triggers. We know traumas that these kids are bringing to the table. We know who's comfortable, who's not comfortable. And we also have a pretty good understanding of that point of what families we are going to be dealing with. So one of the things that we keep in mind when we approach this is that there are so many avenues to teaching the Holocaust that we can't cover them all, nor is it appropriate to cover them all. We focus a lot on the resistance and how people resisted in different forms of resistance, which of course leads us into the project that we'll get to on Terrazine. But you, there is an expectation at times, depending on the district and the, and the audience, that you may get a parent get parent pushback or parents may be questioning. And the, you just want to be prepared to be open with parents on how you're approaching it, what what topics you're going to be discussing with their kids, how they are appropriate and showing them the resources and just keeping that open. And if needed, making adjustments. If there is a, a family or a student who maybe isn't able or doesn't want to, or there's a comfort level, then what other avenues can you take to adjust? So if we're talking about resistance and you know you have a religious issue or something about someone doesn't want to do the Holocaust or isn't able, what other areas of resistance could you bring in that are appropriate so they can still complete the project, but and they're still learning the skills, but in a way that is comfortable for both student and family. So Terezine, give you a little background. Um, it was originally, oh, let me start, sorry, it was 30 miles north of Prague. And in 1940, it was actually changed from a resort um, to a ghetto camp. And more than 150,000 Jews were sent to this particular camp. 15,000 were children. Um, it was used as a propaganda tool, and it was also it also tricked um, the the, Amer the Red Cross. Um, so in 1943, the Red Cross um, scheduled a um, inspection. They ordered an inspection of this particular camp. So immediately, a beautification process began, where they were shipping out Jews. Um, to other camps um, to show less crowded rooms, um, paint, the, just very, they just cleaned it up and made it look like this fabulous place. Um, and it was interesting because as the Red Cross was to, um, touring Terezin, they never diverted from the path they were being led. So they never took a, a second look at anything. They just listened to what was being presented to them. And from there, they made their decision that in fact, if they had a positive impression of, of the camp. Um, and it's interesting because the residents were instructed that if spoken to by anyone from the Red Cross, they were not to converse at all um, with the visitors. So it was all also uh, very vibrant with art and music. And Ellen's going to lead into that. Um, so when we're teaching this, um, we focus on Friedel Dicker Brandis, who was running art classes for the students. There's a lot of fantastic books out there of the work that she did and the work that she encouraged students to do. Um, it's really fun when we're looking, when the kids are analyzing the artwork, because since we're focusing on it's the Holocaust, there's a lot of negative, the kids sometimes assume the worst when they're analyzing the artwork. 
but it's interesting. A lot of them are trying to find joy. Um, and then also when we'll be talking about the music of Raphael Schechter, um, Raphael Schechter was a director. Um, he was very deliberate in trying to do a cry for help with using Verdi's Requiem, which is a Catholic mass um, that focuses on kind of, we need help, liberate us. Um, this um, Requiem was played for the Nazis and um, he was able to get this whole um, chorus to memorize this incredibly hard music and try and deliver this secret message. And it was really fascinating when we were asking about, when we were looking at the kids and um, talking about the Red Cross. Tracy, did you want to say about how the kids were? Yeah, in particular last year, the kids um, had a, a very strong response to the um, the Red Cross failing. Um, and it, it, all, it created many, many feelings um, of, for our own students that how could someone come in and inspect um, this area and find nothing wrong. Um, and in last year in particular, like I said, was very, that was a, a topic that my particular students really, really wanted to discuss. All right. So this project all started, we began teaching the call cost probably seven or eight years ago, I'd say. And when we began, I really needed something that I wanted the kids to have some background knowledge. I didn't want to start a Holocaust novel in reading class because I didn't know where what they were coming in with. And I thought if we just go right into a novel where we're discussing topics that they have no background knowledge on, we're not, it's not going to be a success. So I came across a scholastic um, magazine that was put out that year and it was directed directly to, towards middle school. It was a six to eight magazine. So I purchased it and I started to use a world cafe piece where students were working together, reading different articles and it's broken down into different topics. And they were discussing, working on questions. And one of the, as I was working through it that first year, I came across this terrazine. And I was like, what is this? Because it was the, the one and only article in there that mentioned children and really talked at all about them. And I thought, well, if we're really going to reach 11 year olds, we need to make it something that they can relate to in some aspect. Obviously, the Holocaust isn't going to be relatable to an 11 year old in the events that happen, but can we get them involved in some way with a topic and a discussion that they can relate to? So, we, I went to Alan and said, hey, let's look into this terrazine. Let's make something with this. And so we, we went back and forth and it did not look like it does now our first year. We tried something and eventually we kept building with it. And our first idea was, I said, I want the kids to look at the, look at what those kids did and let's see what we can do. So we created this museum project where our students look at other students work who were in Terrazine, and then they have to go ahead and use that to kind of guide themselves through this process and to create their final product for the class. So let, this is kind of some logistics about the project. So as Casey said, we normally do this about the first week of May. Um, and we have a four, we used to be a 44 minute block. Now we're up to 47 minute block. Um, it takes about one week in the library where they're doing guided research, and we are also that night, that week, at, week, I try and go through outside of class and check in on Google Classroom and check what they have written and give them feedback outside of class as well. Um, and then they have one week independently before they present, so there's some time built into the day, either our homeroom period, where they can come down and get help, but it kind of gives them that buffer zone of if I need to get my bearings and polish it up before and the presentation is this museum project so everyone loads their slideshow on their chromebook and we just set the chromebooks up around the room and they go around and look at each other's slideshows independently there's no standing up in the front of the room they don't have to bear their souls or, or what they their deep thoughts it's kind of self-paced so this is kind of what it looked like um, all of our teachers that teach the Holocaust um, were trained in echoes and reflection. So that's a curriculum that deals with the Holocaust. And it's really good about trying to make sure we're being developmentally appropriate. So we looked at kind of what um, tools were provided within that and how, what best practices they encourage and looking at novel studies that we've done. So then we looked for some resources um, that, and that's where we started finding the artwork from Friedel Dicker Brandis. And um, I was familiar with the Defiant Requiem uh, because of some stuff. I had the chance to see the, the um, music performed 
um, a few years ago. So I looked at them as I liked that as like a hook. So that since I was familiar with that, I used that as a hook. We found the artwork and created a resource. And I'm actually going to bounce up here so that way you can see kind of what our guides look like um, in terms of how students could look for their artwork. So this is about a 20 page document. Um, it has the artwork um, that the students could choose from and their artist. Um, of course, the internet's being slow. There we go. So we have some nice artwork. They can scroll through and find something that speaks to them. And I love how everyone kind of has a different taste of what artwork is most exciting to them. And it's also important to note that we do include poetry mm -hmm. in this project as well. You would think that middle school kids would immediately jump to the artwork and truly they they enjoy the poetry. A lot of the kids will end up with a poem and they, they will you know, dig through the words of that instead of going directly to the art. So both of those seem to be um, good, good examples to use because we do have kids that go in both directions with either looking at art or picking a picking up example of poetry. Um, and speaking of that, we have some examples of the student reactions right here. So some of them chose art and their reactions are right next to it. I did make sure I grabbed a poetry example as well. Um, it's very interesting, which it, I feel like we can never predict what kids are going to pick certain things because kids I think are going to like my favorite's the fish one. It's my favorite piece of artwork. Um, and some years I can't get it, some periods I can't get anyone to pick the fish. Um, and certain poems that I think, oh, this is a little dark. This is pretty blunt about what's going on. The kids really like how honest it is. Um, so to get started, we're kind of connecting in our novel study. I show the Defiant Requiem trailer um, because it has interviews with survivors. It kind of shows the kids what it was like. It's got scenes from the actual Terrazine camp. Um, then we listen to an interview with Roman Kent. Um, he talks about the thought of resistance, uh, spiritual resistance, and sometimes that not all resistance has to be with a gun. Um, he's very um, honest that sometimes just surviving and getting through something is a form of resistance. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the eyewitness database, um, that is a program where you can go through and search survivor testimonies, um, nice short interviews. You can search through different experiences that they've had, um, they're categorized by in multiple different ways, and they're nice short interviews that embed with your lessons. Also, if you're using Echoes and Reflections website, they will actually specify which of those videos from Eyewitness go directly with the lesson. So if you're looking for a lesson specifically on Jewish resistance or non-Jewish resistance, on their website is very broken down very easily. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by Eyewitness, not knowing where to look, the Echoes does a really nice job of kind of pinpointing which of those videos would go with a specific topic that you may be interested in teaching for the Holocaust. Um, the other thing we do is we talk about kind of introduce the propaganda at Terrazine. Um, that there is a video online of it's the actual propaganda video. Um, and it's interesting kind of seeing what we know about the Holocaust, looking at the trailer, listening to survivor testimonies, and then comparing this propaganda video and asking them what doesn't seem right here. Um, and then we let them go through that document, find their artwork. Um, and everyone in the class picks a different piece of artwork. There can be multiple kids in the same grade level with the same artwork, but in the same within classes, everyone's picking something different. Um, so the problem is with this project, most of these um, teenagers were murdered when they were, most of these kids were murdered when they were teenagers. So there is not a lot of information about them at all. Um, and we've noticed when our kids do searching, we are getting into that habit of just typing things into Google, hoping it pops up in the first few responses um, or on the big white box. So we have to kind of introduce some new search strategies to really stretch it. So you'll notice in that document, um, not only did I have the, where the image came from, I've got the um, artist and we have the artwork. So we love doing reverse image searching where you go to images.google.com, either put in the image or put in the image URL, and it'll look against other websites. Um, some kids have luck finding that. Um, there's a couple where it'll explicitly tell them what their artwork is or about their person. Some artworks are just so 
basic um, in terms of just simplicity, they're pencil lined, it's just hard to find and it doesn't work. Um, but it's kind of nice to introduce this skill because even as an adult, I sometimes forget that this skill is super useful. The other thing is, is that one of our favorite Holocaust um, databases is this holocaust.cz. It is a Czech website. Um, so we have to go through and uh, use the translating feature. Now there is, they'll translate it for you, but even refer, refreshing them on how to use Google Translate. Um, the other thing is we have to think about perspectives. Um, this database is really good about listing dates of transports, who was on the transport, how many were murdered, how many were survived. Um, but our kids don't realize that it's a European website, so all the dates are written in the European style. So we constantly have to say, well, there's no 24th month. You got, let's rethink this, let's think logically, and thinking big picture beyond our American um, version of the world. And one of the things to keep in mind if you want to replicate a project like this is that we have, this is a May project. So we've had these kids for at this point, 160 days or so. We've really scaffolded the research skills throughout the year. So the kids are ready for this in-depth research. They're ready for the struggle of this research project because at the beginning of the year, we set the stage with, okay, we're gonna do this first research project, use these websites. And we provide that and we work, we walk them through it. And then another research project or another project, we kind of step back a little bit and say, well, now, you know, what, what resources do you think you can find? And then when they get to this one, when they've already done several others, they're okay with the struggle. This is not a project that you necessarily want to start with because you could really increase the frustration level of your students if they're trying to dig into something they can't find very early in the school year. But because they have enough tools under in their belt and then because they have a comfort level with research, they are okay navigating these websites and navigating the fact that they can't find everything. And one of the things we do with that is we don't expect with this project that you're going to put this on slide one, you're going to put this on slide two, we're going to put this on slide three. We say, here's the expectation, here's the things or the topics that you need, and you figure out how to do that. Because what happens is if you have a poem by Teddy, who we don't even know who Teddy is, you're not going to find anything on Teddy. So you may have one slide that says, Teddy was in Terezin, no additional information can be found. Well, then the expectation is now where can you put more on other slides? So are you going to add more about Terezin or are you going to find something on Auschwitz because this person went there? So we, we kind of do step back a little bit and put that into the hands of the students, but they're able to handle it because we've set that expectation throughout the rest of the school year on what we want them to do. Um, in addition to search strategies and kind of promoting that persistence, um, that we're able to really dive into paraphrasing. There are a few fantastic websites on um, Terezin, the Hol US Holocaust Memorial Museum um, is probably my favorite, um, but our students get into that habit of trying to, uh, they, they, paraphrasing is just a hard skill. And this is one where they're definitely gonna get caught. So we keep going through the proofreading process saying, how can we break this down? How can we get this down to the fact fragments, simplest form? How can we think about explaining it to your lunch table or explaining it to your grownups at home? Um, and kind of loop back to some of our lessons that we've done earlier in the year, um, because I know that's something we really struggle with. Um, and then in addition to the research, we make them do the reaction to their artwork last, not because it's not important, but because you can write your reaction without help from an adult. Um, so if you're struggling with your research and need help, let's focus our library time on the things that I can get to help from my teachers and librarian. Um, I can write a paragraph reacting to my artwork on my own time um, or during homeroom or at home. Um, so that's normally encouraged to be last, um, but we do push them to try and make sure it's several, several sentences something thoughtful. What are you thinking? What do you think they're thinking? Just trying to get them to think deeply. Tracy, do you want to talk about the discussions that the kids have when one thinks it's one thing and one thinks it's another? Oh, sure. So the setup of the final project is amazing. Um, you know, dim lights, quiet, um, where the kids walk around. And what they do is they have a sheet on their desk with their presentation. 
and therefore the kids pick something that they liked from the slideshow and record that um, something that they felt from looking at the piece of art that was chosen and it's amazing how many different thoughts are coming from looking at this piece of artwork um, and, and it it's it gives me goosebumps to think about that day when they're walking around the classroom as if it is a museum and to see that the kids are really, really putting their thoughts into um, what they're doing and um, some true feelings come out. And it's nice because um, we don't use anyone's name in reporting. Um, so it's nice because the kids can truly put down there what they're really feeling and, the, and the, the feelings that are provoked are amazing. And actually there's a copy of um, someone, I cornered a kiddo and I was like, hey, um, that, you mind if I screen, if I share this? So the kiddo was pretty good with me posting this of their grades. Um, so they all have their secret number that they're assigned. They know they're only writing on their line. So they're giving the number grade, what they like, something to improve on. And it was so fun. because when I was trying to decide what kiddo to, corner to beg to ask to put it this up here, um, there were so many thoughtful responses. Um, it's not just a, you did good. Um, they're very detailed in terms of, you need more information here. I like the picture in terms of color. Um, and they're very much calling each other out on the tone of it because they understand the weight of the Holocaust. Um, they wanna make sure that they're creating something that's respectful and paying tribute to these kids. Um, so, and I think with that too, it's interesting how with that sheet, even though they can see their classmates responses that their thoughts are just, it's unreal just because one person thought one way, there's such a variety of responses that, and with that too, the, it's interesting when the kids see something in a picture or feel something in a picture and then they find what the actual artist was doing and they're like oh and, and they there is sometimes it's very eye-opening to them that what they see in you know 2022 and in, in their world and what you know what the actual picture is showing can be completely different and the kids and i always I mean, not that we giggle during a Holocaust project, but the one always goes up and I'm like, I think that's a mushroom. And every year the kids say, Mrs. Beeler, it's a train. And I'm like, <laughs> I see a mushroom guys. I just, and so it's just, we always kind of get a laugh because like our perspectives just, even though it's the same picture, the two people can see it so much differently. And then to find what the artist was thinking is just, that's really eye opening. We don't get that a lot um, in the one book that we use. The, I never saw another butterfly. That has a lot of them. And, and, you know, we always make sure that the kids do their part before they go look because we don't want them to be influenced by what it actually is. We want them to see it with fresh eyes. But so that really invokes a lot of great discussions between ourselves as the teachers, between the kids and other students, just even, you know, just looking at things. And it kind of also can bring in with the mental health thing, like accepting people's differences. And, you know, it's okay to see something differently than everyone else, but you still respect that other person's opinion because it's okay to have that opinion. Absolutely. And then it's nice and when we wrap up this project um, that it's so nice that we can bring Desiree in because we are not mental health professionals. And sometimes it feels like we're trying to do the best by these kids, but it's nice to bring in the actual professionals <laughs> who are qualified. <laughs> so I jump in um, for one day of the project I make sure that I understand the project and usually tag it with the kids and say, how's it going? Oh, I get to come to your class one day. So they usually get pretty excited about that. Um, it's also nice because I get all of the, almost all of the sixth graders, which I don't normally have in one captive audience. Um, so we link the mental health conversations to the project in a way that they're all really excited to talk about how they think um, survivors of the Holocaust felt, how they felt in the camp, but then we link it back to how those feelings and experiences they have relate to themselves. So we do talk about the trauma and how if you didn't know that these people lived in a camp and saw the camp, you wouldn't know what they were going through. So we talk a lot about how there are a lot of peers that are going through different traumatic things, have different lives, 
learn differently and we are unaware of that and how we can treat everyone as though we're not really sure what they're going through. So we can greet them with a smile and move on from there. Um, we also talked a lot about stress and how to manage stress because we know in middle school age especially, they have lots of stress and they usually are very much wanting to talk about what stresses them out and not as eager to say how they cope with that or understand how to cope with that. So we link that into some coping skills. Um, first, how do you think the children in the camp calm down? We know using art, music, and then link it to how they use different coping skills and in different settings that there's different coping skills like at home and school and in the community. Um, we then make sure that we practice a couple of the different coping skills. So um, Ellen scanned in, we use grounding with your five sentences, senses. So we go through that actually in the class and have the kids practice it and talk about the five things they can see, four things that they can feel, three things that they can hear, two things they can smell, and one that they might be able to taste. Um, and they actually close their eyes and then open them and practice using this technique. Um, and then I also go through, I have a paper that has tons of different coping skills that they don't even think of as coping skills. They're more like, well, we go for a walk every day, but how do you feel when you go for a walk? Does it calm you down? Then that would be a coping skill. So they're much more aware, I feel, of how things make them feel and make their body feel to know if it that coping skill actually works for them or not. Um, one thing I absolutely loved about the program was even the following year, I had a lot of different students come to my office and say, hey, I've been using that grounding you taught me. And then I'm trying to rack my brain of when I taught this kid <laughs> and realize, oh, it was in that class. I'm like, oh yeah, yep. I'm really glad you like that. And they're like, do you have any more of those skills? I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit. And I just want to know a couple more things maybe I could do, which is huge because typically they may not be the students that really think, oh, I should go talk to her. But it makes me much more, they're more aware of me and that I feel like everyone can go talk to Mrs. Christ versus just, oh, she's crying, she's got to go to Mrs. Christ. Then everybody can come and kids pop in. Oh, I got a hundred on my test. Oh, we're doing that another Holocaust project. Are you going to come in and talk about that? So they're much more eager to just have everyday conversations or ask just for a couple more coping skills. Whereas I think before they would not have been. And the other thing is that I love is that because normally when they get sent to your office, they probably have some guards up mm -hmm. and seeing them out in the classrooms, it's they can get some mental health services without having their guards up and they can be more receptive. So over time, this project, again, it started off in a very, very rough version um, that we've kind of expanded this over time. Um, we locked out um, with, uh, I think the biggest thing we've learned is talking about the things that we're excited about with school and sharing out the awesome things we're doing helps us make connections. So the first way we were able to expand is the Holocaust Resource Center of Buffalo. We were kind of reaching out to them for some resources and some help. And so they sent a thing out on their mailing list saying they were moving offices. So they were moving from a big office to a small office. So they put a call out saying, if you're an educator, come show up. We've got free stuff for you and uh, we'll help you out. And we lucked out this fabulous artwork. These foam boards were of the artwork that we were teaching. So a lot of our projects were in there. So. We were so excited to give that a new home and now we use it every year um and it was really nice because when we were talking with them they gave us book recommendations um and they were just so excited to share and connect and help us make our project better um the second way we were able to expand was um through the defiant requiem foundation um they expanded their education website um and i was looking for some different resources I absolutely love the trailer because um, I just think it's so exceptionally well done. And uh, so they uh, there was a webinar through Echoes and Reflections saying how to use the Defiant Requiem more. So I showed up and then scheduled a follow up meeting with um, Emily from this organization. And we chatted about different things that they were able to offer. Um, and we kind of built this partnership. Um, 
honestly, if I hadn't even attended the webinar and just would have emailed them directly, they would have been just as delightful. Um, so we started um, showing, they gave us the rights to show the Defiant Requiem film at school, um, which is really nice because it helps make the project a little more real. And then Murray Sidlin, the director of the film, um, takes time to Skype with our kiddos and do a Q&A so that way students are able to ask thoughtful questions and expand their project even further. Um, and it's really, again, there's a lot of nuanced information that deals with terazine. So it's so nice to be able to lean on these organizations. Um, and that's the one thing I think that's most important. The most important takeaway is finding these nonprofits and working with them because they have education programs and they are super knowledgeable and they care very deeply about making sure their content is taught well. So even though you're not, not from Buffalo, you might want to check out your local Holocaust Resource Center. There are some all over the um, country and they are all absolutely excellent at trying to make sure that this content is being taught well. Um, so here are some other resources if you're looking to replicate it. Um, all these links hopefully are live in your thing. So the Defiant Requiem Foundation, there's the link to that. Most of their education stuff will require a password, but if you register on their site, they'll send you the password super quick. Um, and they do some awesome summer trainings um, as well to keep an eye out for. Um, Hannah's Suitcase is a book that features some of the artwork that was found. Um, it's by Karen Levine. Um, and then the website is also super extensive. It kind of tells the story in a more summarized way. Basically, um, Hannah's Suitcase is artwork that was buried um, at Terrazine and was found by so, um, students. And they managed to connect with Hannah's brother, George. Um, and it, we're really able to tell his story. The Butterfly Book, I Never Saw Another Butterfly, um, is another one that tells exactly what's happening. It's kind of our go-to book. Echoes and Reflection, the link is live if you need to go look at that. Eyewitness, that is the database of Holocaust resource of um, interviews. You will need to register for it, um, but it is free and an absolute um, CZ. The one thing I find about Unique Valley is that the one we have to translate. I think Ellen might have cut out. Wait, but it's probably the one that we see the most answer. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> I think that the internet might have cut out. Oh no. Do we need to loop back and do anything or? Um, so we, you were just finishing up talking about the resources. So you started cutting out when you were talking about eyewitness. So if you wanted to just finish those yeah, two. We'll loop back, yeah. So eyewitness is a database of Holocaust survivor um, testimonies. Um, you do have to register for it, but it is a very powerful resource. Um, Holocaust CZ um, is one that doesn't get a lot of attention, but it's very different in terms of talking about the transports and the dates. Um, Whoops, do I need to keep screen? Did it cut my screen share as well? It did, yeah. Oh. Okay, let me get the screen share up and going. If it's easier to just finish talking, that's fine too. Whatever. That's okay. Oh, um, I'm a visual learner and I would be cranky if my if I didn't have a visual. So anyways, holocaust.cz has the transports in there. And um, it's really detailed in terms of the name of the transport how many were on it, how many survived. And as Casey was saying, and one of the things that we really like about that website is that it the transports are so detailed that you'll get students who say, hey, my person was on that train too. So you can really start to see some conversations um, transpire in the class between students that necessarily don't usually work together or don't want to be you know, in a group or whatnot. So you can kind of use that as a guide. And I think when we talk about resources, one of the things that you have to keep in mind that makes this project a success in our building and in our district is that your resources also are the people who are around you. Like there are things that in this project that Ellen's just strong with. And there are things that I bring to the table and Tracy brings to the table being the ELA teacher 
And there's things, of course, that Desiree brings in as the mental health professional that we aren't familiar with. So I think it's important when you want to collaborate in a way that we're doing that makes this a success for us, just to remember that everybody has strengths and to play off of those strengths, but also to be open to say, I'm not good at this area of it. So, hey, who can tag in here? Because the best resources sometimes are the ones that are right there in your building that you just need to be willing to open your door and let those people in and let them help you or you help them with, you know, because there's four of us on the project and we couldn't do it without any one of the four of us. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be successful. Um, the other thing that's nice is we kind of train the kids throughout the year of what are each of our skill sets and who is the best person for their particular questions. So they're really good by May of that's a Ms. Stolarski question, that's a Mrs. Meeker question, that's a Mrs. Beeler question. Um, and bouncing back to our resources, um, your local Holocaust Resource Center, they normally have an education person. They might be small, but they are mighty and they are passionate about what they do. So don't be afraid to reach out. Um, sometimes they're, they may not have the most robust tech infrastructure, but being on their mailing list, um, you can learn so much. And I think there should be one more. Yep, any questions? Thank you for taking the time to listen to us and let us share our fabulous project. Thank you all so much for sharing all of this. It was so informative and so interesting to, to hear all your different parts and how they all work together. So thank you for sharing with all of us today. Um, so the chat is now open again. Um, if anyone has any questions for our presenters today, please feel free to put those in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, also, if you just have any comments you want to share or um, if you want to share a similar project that you've been working on at your school, please feel free to do so. Um, we do have a comment that came in already from Genevieve. Um, they say, not so much a question, but a comment. I feel like a similar format approach would be a great way to teach about residential schools. Very Absolutely. Cool. And I know um, that there's just so many great, there's getting to be so many great stories and resources being shared out with what's going on. I'm sure that there would be, a, that it would translate very, very easily. Great, thank you for sharing that, Genevieve. I actually had a question uh, for you all that I was wondering um, throughout this presentation. I know it's only October, so you've just started your school year recently, but do you have any plans for this upcoming um, school year teaching this project again? Any changes or anything you guys wanna update or just what are the plans for this school year? I know I was looking at a fun addition to connect to Desiree's stuff, um, except I haven't told her about it. Um, so this summer, um, I just, I love tracking what different Holocaust education experts are saying. Um, so I listened to um, Alex Zapruder's talk at Chautauqua about her salvage pages stuff. Um, and she kind of did a modern writing thing with COVID and how kids were able to express themselves and especially the fact that it's our kids generation and it's their trauma that they've gone through. Um, and I thought there were some really, really interesting applications with that. So I do have all those websites booked and kind of sitting there thinking, how can we kind of get that self reflection going. Um, but again, it's so hard because May is banana pants. Yeah, um, we are planning to do the project again, it'll look similar to what it has mm -hmm. in the past. Um, Tracy and I are actually talking, we prefer nonfiction Holocaust books. It, they're just, it's the, it's a better route. It really is. We love the boy on the wooden box. It is, it's a lot because it's a longer book. And when you get to May, you don't always have, we don't always have the time because of the state standardized testing that kind of pushes into our schedule. So we are looking this year, it's a similar version. It's called my survival, a girl on Schindler's list which is a nonfiction piece about a girl who survived. And the boy in the wooden box is also a Schindler's List survivor. So we are looking at pulling that resource in this year to add to that nonfiction. And Desiree and I have actually been working together also um, getting her, because, because the project is in May, it works wonders for the curriculum because the kids are ready, but it doesn't work wonders for necessarily getting Desiree in there early enough with the mental health and the coping skills that they really need all year. 
So her and I have been, she and I have been working together this year. She's been pushing into my classes a little bit with some SEL lessons monthly, kind of getting her face out there. Like this is who she is. So the kids are, my kids, I mean, just time-wise, we don't get to everybody, but some of my students are going to know her already. So that's going to help a little bit. And those who don't are going to at least have that resource by the end of the year. So we always are looking to add the project itself is pretty solid, but it does change every year. There's always tweaks. There's always something mm -hmm. that we decide. One year we tried to have the project loop where it just continuously went that no, that was a, a fail for sixth grade. <laughs> so now it's just clicking through. So we may or may not, depending where our kids are with technology, try that looping piece again, where it just runs continuously. It always just depends on where our groups are from year to year. One change that I would like to see is me pushing in just to see their projects because now I've kind of learned a lot more of what they're doing and the discussions they're having that I would be very eager just to see the actual pro projects and I know that they usually love showing off their projects just to help aid in more of those conversations even within the hallway like hey you know you did a really great job on that project I saw it oh really that's great just building that rapport and knowing that I care and other people care. So I'm hoping to push more into just even being in the background of seeing the different projects of the kids because they amaze me every time. Great. Sounds like it'll be a great year on all fronts. Uh, I have another question that came in from our Q&A. Um, and this is a really this is a really great question. Um, Jenna asked, is there a way that the public library can assist your work? We do not usually pick heavy topics such as this and are not required to teach a curriculum or anything. Are there any tips or tricks for other library staff to tackle these types of subjects with the people they serve? So our public librarian is absolutely amazing. We bring her in a lot. Um, Normally, our focus when we bring her in is more community outreach. Um, she does a lot more senior programming, um, just the nature of our public library and the resources she has. And because this project is so specific, um, she doesn't, she hasn't tagged in. Um, but if you're in a situation where um, either the you just especially your first few years doing something with this sort of research where you're digging in and having to dig deep um it definitely would bring in a, be useful to bring in an extra adult who's a strong researcher um because they know some non-traditional ways to hunt for information and even we've also had some, we've built some good relationships with our historical society with some other projects um and I know that there's been interest in some of them tagging in just again, walking around troubleshooting and offering that support, because especially the first few days of this project, when they're hunting, it's a little hairy. Great, thank you for your response. Um, one other question came in, have you thought about adapting this into a curriculum that can be marketed to homeschooling families? Uh, we we don't totally, have it, but we, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's not something I think we've ever talked about or yeah. discussed. Well, and especially um, when we work with our, when our district works with homeschooling families, normally they have them push in for specials, a couple of specials that the families aren't well suited for. Um, we haven't had a chance to build up relationships with homeschooling families in our area, um, but. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, it's perhaps a way um, another public library could work on a project similar like this as well. They have those connections with homeschooling families. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll give just another minute to see if anybody else has any other questions or comments. Um, again, you can put those in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and we'll see if we have anyone else who has a last minute question for you all. Otherwise, I do want to let everyone know that this uh, has been recorded and it will be available within 48 business hours. Um, it will be emailed out to you as well as uploaded to those registration pages too.
And Megan, we can send you um, contact information if anyone has questions yeah. and wants to reach out. If anyone right. wants to share what we're using or resources, we're happy to share them. They're not. <laughs> they're, we're fair game if anybody wants to actually use any of what we're using. So. Great. Thank you all so much. That's always such a helpful resource as well. So it looks like that is all the questions we have today. So I just want to say another huge thank you to our speakers for this presentation um, and to my colleagues who have been helping behind the scenes, um, Samantha Oakley and Hannah Arata for their support of this webinar as well. As I said, the archive version of this session will be available to view online within 48 business hours. And again, just a huge thank you to everyone for joining us today. Have a great weekend.